Your Excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, friends, and all of those uh, joining us online. My name is Henrik Urdal, and I'm the director here at the Peace Research Institute Oslo. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to our headquarters in Oslo and to this opening event of the PRIO AI Days 2024. PRIO is an independent, international and interdisciplinary research uh, institute specializing in peace and conflict research. In our role as a research institution, our primary contribution is the production of rigorous academic analysis. However, our aim is that this effort shall have an impact beyond academia, facilitating knowledge-based policymaking grounded in information analysis and facts. The purpose of the PRIO AI days is to shed light on applications of artificial intelligence in areas relevant to peace and conflict, with research-based approaches informing and engaging a broad set of audiences. This is the first of a total of seven events over these two days, illustrating both the breadth of PRIO engagement on the topic of artificial intelligence and our commitment to engage with stakeholders outside academia. I am very pleased to introduce the keynote lecturer of the PRIO AI days, Branka Panic, who will speak on the topic of AI and peace. Branka is the founder and executive director of AI for Peace, a US-based think tank working to ensure that artificial intelligence benefits peace, security and sustainable development. A key ambition is that diverse voices should influence the creation of AI and related technologies. Branka is a political scientist, expert in international security, international development policy and peace building, and she has established herself as a leading international authority on these critical issues. Following the keynote, uh, time permitting, there will be possibilities for uh, Q&A, so please think about good questions to ask Branka. And I would further uh, like to inform you that this event is being live streamed on PRIO's YouTube channel and a recording will be made publicly uh, available after the event. And then Branka, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for this nice introduction and welcome to PRIO AI Days. How are you this morning? Yes. <laughs> I see a full room ready for a, some very intense conversation on AI, which I uh, hope uh, and please give me a signal if I'm over the time. So I'm really looking forward to doing a little bit of teaser around the uh, discussion around artificial intelligence and AI and then having a space to, to have a conversation. So as I was kindly introduced, my name is Branka Panic. In my language, in English, uh, it's a very, uh, uh, I don't know, ridiculous sounding panic. But my colleagues told me it's a very useful surname to have when you're working in artificial intelligence and peace building today. So I'm embracing it. Um, I'm a founder and executive director of AI for Peace, a think tank working at the intersection of artificial intelligence and AI. I'm also a non-resident uh, research fellow at New York University Central and International Co uh, Corporation, where I'm uh, doing the work on data for peace building and prevention. Um, I'm also a professor of practice, teaching one semester at the University uh, of North Carolina to practitioners in peace building. Um, and I'm a senior advisor on AI at the German Federal Foreign Office uh, Data Innovation Lab. Uh, I am based in Mexico, but I'm originally uh, from Balkans, which you may hear from my accent, which I'm also <coughs> proudly embracing. Uh, but it's really a pr pleasure to be here after having a very long flight from uh, Mexico yesterday. I'm happy to be here. So here we are discussing AI for peace uh, and using AI to creating lasting peace is actually a statement in our vision, but I'm putting a question mark here because I would like to have more this as a question to all of us to see if we are actually to use AI to create lasting peace. So I want to start with this big AI, this artificial intelligence where when we were starting like uh, around 10 years ago, I was living in San Francisco and it was a hype around AI, but mostly in the Silicon Valley, right? Or big 
universities that actually had capacity to do the, this research or big governments and people were talking about this, this single biggest technology revolution the world has ever seen or I'll be sharing some of my favorite quotes here just to show the, the size of the hype. AI will not only be a game changer, but it will disrupt the entire playing field coming from Singularity University and Ray Kurzweil, one of the leading names in this singu Singularity uh, movement, uh, or probably the most famous quote in this field, uh, Stephen Hawking left us with this, that AI is likely to be either the best or the worst thing to happen to humanity. Not an easy uh, legacy to leave us with, but uh, I think it's uh, optimistic to know that it's still in our hands if this will be the best or the worst thing to happen. So what is actually happening beyond the hype, right? Ten years after, um, the, the AI is not only in big universities and big governments, it's actually becoming part of all of the industries and fields. And here I am using the resource of uh, AI Index, the Stanford one, probably one of the most prominent yearly reviews of the stage of the development of artificial intelligence. And here you can see some of the data that I wanted to share, that AI has surpassed human human performance on several benchmarks, including image classification, visual reasoning, English understanding, but still it's very much behind on some more complex tasks, such as the competition level mathematics or visual common sense reasoning uh, and planning. So the number of AI publications in the world is increasing. So uh, here you can see between 2010 and 2022, the total number of AI publications nearly tripled. Um, and the increase over the last year was maybe a more modest one of 1.1%, which we will see if we actually uh, reach this saturation stage in publishing or not. Uh, the next uh, um, uh, AI reviews will show. What's happening with the private investment? We, we saw this increase over the years where global private AI investment has fallen for the... So here we, have, we see an interesting trend that it's actually falling in the last two years. Um, although less than the sharp decrease from 2021 to 2022. However, the count of newly founded AI companies still is spiking up to 40.6% from the previous year. So we will also have to wait a couple of years to see what this actually decrease is meaning, if it's meaningful at all. But what's even more interesting for me is this graph. So despite this decline in overall AI private invest investment last year, funding for generative AI surged nearly eight uh, uh, times more from 2022 um, to 2023. So this is this new hype that we entered with, right, with the generative AI. So we'll also see what does this mean. Why I'm sharing this here is because I want us to be aware that again, AI, and now especially with generative AI hype, we are entering in a completely new um, uh, uh, era, so to say, in artificial intelligence development, because AI is not only in universities, now the governments uh, or all of the industries, it's actually becoming part of all of our homes as well. Suddenly, it's becoming a discussion that we have with our kids, that students have in universities, uh, that we have in companies. And here is an, in an interesting data that I picked up from AI Google Trends score, um, which is, you know how Google, Google is actually scoring how certain topic is popular on, on Google search. And in 2022, AI had this score of uh, 11, with zero being not searched for at all, and 100 indicating that something is really popular topic. Only one year after, the AI is uh, uh, getting this AI Google trend of 100. So this is this difference that we have in general public picking up of what is actually happening in AI. So I, I updated, updated this just recently because I thought it's quite interesting since we are here in Nordics and since some of the uh, Nobel Prizes have just been awarded uh, last week, right, or several days ago, uh, just to share that AI reached Nobel as well. So John Hopfield and Jeffrey Hinton uh, were awarded a Nobel Prize in Physics for 2024 for foundational discoveries and inventions that enable machine learning with artificial intelligence neural networks. And Jeffrey Hinton is 
uh, if you were following this entire, uh, I mean, he's in news all the time. Since he left Google, he wanted to have this more independent voice in the field to speak more independently. He's the so-called godfather of AI. Uh, and he was awarded one of the awardees of the Nobel Prize in Physics, which on the right side, uh, just for this occasion, I actually went back to Twitter and I left it after uh, uh, Musk bought it. But just for this occasion, uh, I went back to pick up some of the tweets uh, because such a discussion has been created around this because people started complaining, why would anybody who works on AI actually got a Nobel Prize for physics? Uh, here you can see some of the uh, quotes here. Phys is this physics at all? Are we talking now about machine learning as uh, uh, physics? I can only imagine the pain of physicists, was this decision made by GPT? Uh, so quite a frustration out there of how the AI is actually changing field and if this award uh, should be given to AI creators or users at all or not. Uh, and just to add a little bit to the pain of physicists, just a couple of days after the Nobel Prize in Chemistry has been awarded. Uh, and David Baker shared this award with Demis Hassabis and John Jumper, uh, the first one for computational protein design, the second two for protein structure predictions, so again, the utilization of machine learning, uh, and another conversation starting, including one of the, I'm, I'm quoting this, my colleague Virginia Dignum, who is a professor of computer science uh, at the University of Sweden, who is commenting about this as a, actually as a triumph of interdisciplinarity. So we cannot talk separately now about AI. AI is becoming part of all of the disciplines and it can actually contribute substantially uh, to many fields of our work. So I'm quoting her, the real breakthroughs in science are no longer the domain of a single discipline, but require a broad perspective and the combination of different insights. Um, so let's see, I don't know, what are the chances that the next Nobel Peace Prize is awarded to somebody who works in AI? Can I see hands? <laughs> <laughs> no hands? Okay, let's see, maybe we'll remember this conversation in a couple of years. Although technically, I have to say, although Maria Ressa did not uh, won the Nobel Peace Prize for AI, I think her work as a journalist is very connected to the use of algorithms, so we can debate as well if that award has already been given to somebody who has been working at least around the AI and peace and journalism uh, domain. So today AI is everywhere and it is transforming uh, our societies. Um, another interesting moment uh, um, around GPT-3, uh, OpenAI's uh, language generator, the, the one edition before uh, GPT-4, uh, um, got an assignment. This was just an experiment by professionals in the field to test how actually model response questions regarding the peace building. The model was asked if AI is actually coming uh, uh, in peace. Uh, and uh, I guess ChatGPT is also loving the quotes of Stephen Hawking as, as I do. So this was the quote from the model that Stephen Hawking has warned that the AI could spell the end of the human race. I'm here to convince you not to worry. AI will not destroy humans, believe me. And I love this framing of believe me because I think we will be talking a lot about trustworthy AI as well uh, and the entire ethics field. So I'm putting this intentionally here as a sort of a teaser for some of the panels that will be coming uh, throughout the next two days. Um, no matter what uh, AI told us not to worry, a lot of people started worrying, and this is, again, uh, the media started being overwhelmed, especially after the uh, generative AI uh, revolution started with these news about how AI can destroy humanity, that AI uh, has much to offer, but it could also wreak terrible harm, that it must be controlled, the quote from one of the most prominent figures as well in the AI field, Stuart Russell, that AI could wipe out humanity. Some of the biggest names in technology war warned developments in AI could spell the end of humanity. So you see the, the trend, talking a lot about existential risks and huge risks to even uh, survival of human race coming from uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, following this one, one of my favorite uh, uh, quotes, I think, coming from the um, time of the pandemic from one of the researchers in tr trustworthy AI, Roman Jampolsky, computer scientist who said, if a virus with IQ level zero can make this damage, referring to COVID, right? 
imagine what a virus with a level intelligence thousand can do. Um, and then, um, if this is a hype or not, we, we will see as all the future will show. Uh, but another name in this field, Joshua Bengio, who is a professor uh, and AI researcher in, at University of Montreal, also uh, uh, following this uh, uh, line of, of questioning, saying today's systems are not anywhere close to posing an, an existential threat today, right? But in one to five years, there is too much uncertainty. That is the issue. We are not sure this won't pass some point where things get catastrophic. So even from people who are deeply in the field, this sort of uh, insights are coming uh, to the surface. Uh, now, two quick quotes. I had to put this here um, uh, from two uh, pr prominent researchers in, in generative AI field. Um, uh, one coming from Sam Altman, uh, who I quote, is saying that AI systems that can do any task a human can will be developed in reasonably close-ish future, which I think is uh, uh, quite a funny quote to have. Uh, and then completely different line of thinking, right, from, from people in the field, um, such as the one from Jan Lekan, the chief uh, AI scientist at, at Facebook, uh, who says, I quote, human level AI systems are going to take a long time uh, to actually be developed. So long story short, there are two lines of thought, um, and we will see actually in which direction the field uh, goes. Uh, now, what I also want to stress, also, although I was quoting a lot of uh, 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 men researchers in the field, I also want to point out that maybe not accidentally, there are a lot of women as well who are in the field and who want to point out that instead of putting so much emphasis on existential risks, on something that can come long time in the future, or maybe never, we should actually be concentrated on so-called AI harms, actual harms that are happening today from this technology. Uh, and we need to reveal these harms and to do everything that we can to stop them, including in the data science field. So again, going back to the ethics and, and trustworthy uh, work that needs to be strengthened uh, in the field. Uh, now I'm introducing these topics uh, as a sort of uh, introduction to my work at AI for Peace. Um, and what we are doing, we are actually looking at, at those real happenings. So where the technology is now and how it actually impacts the, the conflict and peace. And when we were starting the organization, we first looked at uh, the field and we realized that military uses of AI are multiple and advanced. So there are a lot of applications in military, national security, in battlefield, uh, warfare platforms, target recognition, uh, combat simulation and training. Of course, the most discussed one and the most prominent probably autonomous weapon systems, so-called killer robots, threat monitoring and situational awareness, a lot of what we will be discussing here as well, early warnings, early actions, but for specific use in military. And what we realized then is that exploring and utilizing AI in peace building is very limited. So this is the, the gap that we wanted uh, to, to fill in, and not only to fill in, but to actually give more space creating a platform for all of the organizations that are already doing the work and many of you sitting in the room today to actually have the possibility to further advance and develop the entire ecosystem of organizations that are working in AI for peace. Or AI in peace building, what we consider by that is strategic activity to solidify peace, to avoid violent conflicts, so not necessarily wait for conflict to happen and then to react, but to actually work on the prevention, to provide the tools for building something more than just the absence of war, to strengthen capacities for conflict management, and to lay the foundation for sustainable peace and development. And in that sense, uh, we, we stress that peace should be understood not as a negative term, not as absence of violence, but rather as a positive one, the presence of social trust, resilience to violence, strong civic and community institutions to manage conflicts when they arise. So we are 
we are also recognizing that the AI for Peace is not a new field, it's a sort of a continuation of uh, the work that has already started as part of the peace tech community and broader even digital peace building as the nexus uh, uh, between the field of peace building and digital technologies. So peace builders and people from the field as well uh, have been trying for forever since we invented radio, right, and, and mobile phones and television or any sort of technology to see what is the potential of this technology uh, to actually apply it in peace building to sustain pe uh, peace and build the capacities of actors in the field. So we also asked the question, why, why would peace builders now look into the AI and why is that even possible? Why now? Uh, and that now is already now, as I said, almost uh, 10 years on, for some organizations, maybe a little bit longer, for some maybe a little bit less, but those are basically the, the most of the factors that enable this work. So computer processing, the cost of computer processing power that has fallen dramatically, availability of data, right? The cost of uh, cloud access or data storage, or even the availability of data, the, the, the satellite, video, image, news, text are, all growing at a massive speed, scale, and frequency, and are available to many organizations out there, even organizations with lo low resources, to actually access these data sets and to use in their own work. And then the developments and utilization of highly advanced statistical modeling and the use of machine learning, neural networks, natural language processing to actually analyze this, uh, this data. So all of these overlapping trends in the AI field enable this work for us. And then I think this question is not even necessary for this audience. I think we are all deeply engaged in the field of peace building to know why is it so necessary to actually work on peace, why peace and why now. And I'm sharing here some of the uh, resources in the field, such as Institute for Economics and Peace, Global Peace Index, that is uh, telling us continuously, this is the result from 2023, uh, that the average level of global peacefulness deteriorated for the ninth consecutive year. This data is really uh, heartbreaking from UNHCR. Uh, since I started doing this presentation many years ago, I've been updating these um, numbers on a yearly basis. We see how the number of people in need uh, is increasing and the number of resources, the funding is decreasing. So we are in deeply need to change something, to do something in terms of uh, unprecedented humanitarian crisis, democracy decline, more pro problems on conflict side. So I just speaking some uh, the most uh, recent data published that 90% um, of deaths in conflicts are actually civilians. Since pandemic, the number of violent events has gone up 22%. This is quite shocking that one in six of us live in a place of active conflict, um, that conflict is increasing most quickly. In middle income states, and I, I'm going to repeat this because for me this was quite a shocking uh, 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 statement and something that we are actually learning from data, right? Getting more insights on how our world is changing. So conflict is increasingly most uh, is increasing most quickly in middle income states and states that introduce some democratic practices. It's not only related to state weakness and fragility. So I'm coming from Balkans and I lived through wars, and our entire notion of building democracy in our region was basically on this premise that if we build democracy, if we work on democratization, we will avoid slipping into conflict again. So just learning about these changing contexts and how our societies, how conflicts are becoming more complex and difficult to understand, it's really important to understand how we will actually sustain peace. The protracted, protracted nature of conflict, seven out of 10 uh, haven't had a year of peace in the last 10 years. Uh, and then conflicts evolving much faster than our ability to, as I said, to understand them and address them. So th these are all of the reasons why we are potentially looking into artificial intelligence, machine learning, natural language processing. Can this be another tool in a toolbox of peace builders to actually help us do this work more uh, effectively, more faster, more efficiently? 
And this is why we started AI for Peace with a vision of a future in which AI benefits peace, security, and sustainable development, and where diverse voices influence creation of AI and related technologies. I'm especially emphasizing uh, the diverse voices, and maybe at this point, I can just ask a quick question to the audience in the room. Uh, how many people are actually coming from conflict areas here who have lived experience of conflict? Okay, thank you for sharing. Uh, how many people worked in conflict areas? And so maybe for the online audience, I will say the first question was maybe two people. Now we have maybe five people in the room. And how many people work on conflict or consider themselves experts either in data and peace building? I assume now everybody will raise the, the hand in the room. So this is the idea of actually us bringing other voices to the room as well, including those who have lived experience uh, in conflict or those who have expertise either on peace building or data si uh, science side. Because I already heard uh, uh, before we started the day today that some people find maybe that they're not belonging to the room, right? If we talk about data science, peace builders feel maybe they're not part of the conversation or the other way around. And this is our perception that basically this work cannot be done if you are not uh, all working together uh, on this and bringing these diverse experiences to the table. So um, a quick uh, note that I will share some of the uh, insights from the, the work uh, that I've been doing as well as, as my role of a researcher in, at New York University, uh, where with my dear colleague Paige Arthur, uh, who although also collaborated with many of you in the room, uh, we worked together on this project Data for Peace uh, to map the entire ecosystem, the entire, at least we started mapping the ecosystem of organizations who are using technology uh, in peace building and then uh, worked on capacity building for different organizations in this space. Out of this work um, at New York University and out of uh, the work of AI for Peace, uh, we were invited to actually publish a book uh, a sort of a primer for uh, any organization that wants to enter the space, either from peace building or data science side, to have a sort of an introduction, what is this AI for peace, and what, what are the pot all of the potential applications of artificial intelligence in peace building. So uh, this is the book that provides a sort of a new perspective on artificial intelligence as a potential force for good in conflict-affected countries through its use in early warning, combating hate speech, human rights investigations, and analyzing the effects of climate change on conflict. So I'll give a teaser just with a two or three topics. I'll not share everything, although the book is, and I actually brought it, but I forgot to, to get it out. It's a very short, uh, intended to be a very quick reading primer. Uh, and when we presented the book at uh, UNDPPA DPO, we actually got a, um, a comment that it should be even shorter because people on executive positions don't have that much time to actually read. Um, so this, is, this was the idea to provide some teaser to get really people interested to get engaged in this field and then to explain what are these potential uh, applications so the book is full of different examples how organizations are uh, using artificial intelligence for peace building. The first one conflict in conflict prediction where preventing violent conflict before it starts is the goal of every person in this field given the devastation of war. And we present different um, uh, um, conclusions now on where this place is actually now and what are all of the advancements that were happening in the AI and conflict prediction, that the important AI assisted is assistant gains uh, that have been made in the past 10 years are mostly in forecasting which countries are at highest risk of violence, that researchers have more successfully focused on using the power of data to identify uh, rising risk risks of violence and forecast potential hotspots, and that researchers have been using machine learning techniques to achieve a measure of success in forecasting violent conflicts, especially in the short term, uh, and especially in countries where there is already a degree of um, violent conflict. So the important conclusion was also, as I mentioned already in the introduction, that the drivers of instability uh, uh, or violence or conflict are also changing throughout the time. So the models that we are developing in this field also need to um, uh, adjust as well. So 
We share, as I said, the number of examples, and I think people in the room uh, are deeply into this uh, field as well, and we couldn't uh, um, simply write the book not mentioning the work of Prio and Views, uh, which is the most prominent example of this work in the field, and we'll be hearing more about this throughout the day and tomorrow as well. Um, and then we do make a difference of uh, different early warning uh, and prediction models um, uh, such as uh, views and the ones that are actually serving uh, to uh, as an immediate warning to civilians uh, in conflict zones. So this is an example that we are sharing, uh, sentry application by HALA systems um, that is collecting the data from remote acoustic sensors positioned in Syria, which record sounds that can help identify the type and speed uh, of the planes. So basically machine learning is processing the both the sound and information of human uh, monitors in the field to be able to announce the warning to civilians uh, in the war zones, to basically send a message when the attack will happen so that the civilians um, can uh, uh, move quicker uh, to, to the safety. So an algorithm helps to determine if the plane is actually a threat, so it can recognize which type of plane it is and if it's actually going to uh, bomb a certain area. Um, and if warning should go to civilians in the area through this simple uh, smartphone app. So another interesting field of study um, is uh, the artificial intelligence, which is used to understand the mechanics through which peace systems maintain peaceful relationships uh, and explain the complex uh, elements of these peace systems. So peace systems being clusters of uh, neighboring communities who do not go to war with one another, which I think is quite an interesting uh, we can debate if it's a new field, but definitely the data science is contributing to, to the further insights of what actually, so not when conflicts and why conflicts happen in a certain area, but why peace happens, right? And what makes certain uh, uh, country or, or group of countries uh, peaceful, and this is an interesting point that I picked up from this research, that five Nordic countries, nations, have not engaged in war uh, with one another since 1815, having in mind that we are again positioned here here in Nordic, I thought, I thought it's an interesting element to also learn from uh, how uh, countries sustain peace. Uh, the second uh, um, chapter, in second chapter, we cover the issue of AI and, and hate speech. And our focus here is on artificial intelligence um, that has not only led to massive proliferation of hate speech, but also in some cases used to detect these instances to limit and actively uh, counter it. And the main uh, conclusion from this chapter and research, I think, was that, uh, yes, algorithms definitely spread hate but the threat is so big at this point, having in mind how much we are using the social media, how much we are using the online spaces, that we will not be able to tackle such amount of uh, threat without actually using the same tool, without uh, us, us, um, using machine learning to allocate the instances of hate speech and potentially remove these instances in, in cases when they are uh, harmful, when they are not a value, uh, uh, when they are not uh, harming the freedom of speech as well. So this is very contextual, uh, depending from the country in the United States, for example, the freedom of, of speech is a very uh, uh, protected under constitution as well. In some other countries, the context is different, so the application of different tools is also um, able uh, in, in different ways. So we start the chapter with uh, genocide in Rwanda, and uh, um, this year, 2024, we marked the 30th uh, anniversary as well, uh, unfortunately, of this huge crime. And we could have, we mentioned other uh, crimes of genocide in my own region as well, in Srebrenica, in Bosnia, just mentioning how hate speech and hate crime is not a new thing and how the communities were dealing with this problem for, for a long, long time. However, in digital space, uh, the, the speed uh, and, and scale of spreading the hate speech is something different and something 
that we still need to figure out how to hope with. So um, we look intensively into uh, Meta and Facebook because simply so much has been uh, published and researched uh, in this company, but we could have looked into other examples and other social networks as well. This is, I think, an important figure just to understand uh, how big of a problem we have in companies like this to tackle uh, this amount of hate speech, where um, the ratio of Facebook moderators to users uh, is one to 160,000 a scale that obviously suggests that human content moderators will not be able to cover uh, uh, all of the amount that we are posting uh, online. When we add to that this the amount of misinformation and disinformation and hate speech, so those are all different categories but can be equally uh, harmful, uh, we have a big problem uh, to tackle. So additionally, uh, when we interviewed and we worked, we worked on our own projects as well. So we developed different machine learning systems at AI for Peace and New York University to actually detect the instances of hate speech. We worked specifically, the latest uh, project was in Sri Lanka, in conflict communities there. And then working with people from the field uh, who actually experienced the conflicts, who, who were uh, our uh, data labelers in this case. So they were collecting instances of hate speech from social media, we realize how this work is also harmful uh, for their own psychological health. So this is another, because they're being re-traumatized reading these instances over and over again that are actually targeting themselves and their own communities. So having this uh, uh, on our mind as well, we see the potential benefits of technology being helpful and reducing some amount of this work of human monitors uh, and putting in putting it in the hands of uh, uh, machine learning where we train, of course, the systems in a proper way to, to be able to do this. Um, why this is especially important, uh, although Rwanda and in my own case, when wars in my region were happening, uh, there, were, there was no internet, we did not have mobile phones, uh, and uh, uh, the hate was spreading mostly through one TV station that we had. Uh, my entire conviction was when we started using social media that that will be a cure uh, for the fact that uh, in, in the times of uh, wars in the Balkans, we had only one access of information. However, it proved to be completely the opposite case, right? And uh, uh, this is why it's important to work on this. And we are mentioning the case of uh, 2017 and Facebook inciting violence and ethnic cleansing in uh, Myanmar. Um, where uh, um, Facebook was misused to, to basically create another uh, genocide when we committed uh, as a humanity that that will never happen. Why this is additionally important is because uh, through people like this, this is uh, Francis Hogan, one of the whistleblowers from Meta, uh, who went years after uh, Myanmar uh, and went publicly. Uh, she basically copied all of the documents internally from Facebook and decided to publish this. Uh, she testified at Congress as well uh, to say that we are not, we as tech companies, big tech companies, are not doing enough to uh, tackle this amount of. Uh, um, uh, problem that we are facing with hate speech online, that unquestionably the social media is making hate, hate uh, uh, worse, um, that algorithms were promote, uh, provoking ethnic violence by picking up extreme sentiments, sentiments and divisions, so picking this content content exactly because it was hateful and spreading it more and faster than anything else. Uh, her quote is as well that the situations in Myanmar and more recently in Ethiopia, it happened again in Ethiopia, um, are only the opening chapters of a story so terrifying that no one wants to read uh, the end of it. So this is why uh, not only big tech companies, but many organizations in academia, in civil society, uh, stressing this importance of this research going outside of uh, our own houses, right? And going externally out there uh, and working in collaboration across different sectors to actually be able to tackle uh, this uh, problem of, of hate speech. Uh, however, we in the book allocate a lot of technical problems and societal problems in uh, doing this correctly. And he, here is a, a list of some of these, such as contextual uh, uh, nature of the hate speech, that sometimes it's very difficult for these systems to actually be trained to recognize when something is 
a real hate speech and something is quote of a hate speech, when we are retelling that something happened, when we want, want to point out uh, that a situation, a harmful situation is happening in a certain region. This especially affected when we started using these systems, the work of journalists and human rights defenders who are there to share the real situation from the conflict zones, where these systems started automatically removing that content as hateful while it was actually point, pointing to uh, the fact the, the violations of human rights uh, and instances of violation in, in certain countries. Um, the machines at this point are very easy to be tricked as well because with uh, simple typos, with change uh, of a letter or even in a word, one research showed that uh, any instance of hate, hateful speech that has just uh, added love as a word uh, to its content was able to trick uh, the system so it doesn't recognize uh, the instance as a hate speech. So a lot of work to, to be done, but again, uh, it, it will be needed to be able to... Um, tackle this amount of a problem. Uh, we are in a book mentioning um, a lot of examples of uh, civil society organizations, academia, and the private sector who are already using the technology. One of my favorite ones uh, is a moonshot that I'm singling out here as an example of combating hate speech uh, by redirecting uh, it to resources, education, uh, to support groups. Uh, so it's a sort of a using um, uh, the same algorithms that would promote something for us to buy, uh, to using them to promote the resources uh, that can deal with the hate speech. Um, so it's, pro it's basically providing alternatives to extremist views, to extremist choices uh, and uh, narratives. Following this one and very closely uh, connected with the issues of uh, hate speech is also the use of artificial intelligence and uh, uh, for uh, human rights protection. Uh, and we are acknowledging here that there are a lot of, uh, unfortunately, currently applications, uh, harmful applications of AI for uh, uh, human rights uh, through mass surveillance, facial recognition, uh, or biometrics. Uh, ho however, we are not covering these issues in the book because we wanted to concentrate on, on more uh, positive examples where AI is actually used to uh, help human rights defenders protect their human rights. So a very interesting um, insight is this combination of some of the traditional uh, technologies, such as uh, geospatial uh, geo information technologies and this increased number of satellites uh, and greater availability of images. Uh, with the so-called digital witness movement. So the fact that um, so many people in conflict zones are currently the digital witnesses, right? Having a mobile phone and collecting the information through photos, through videos about what is happening around them is a very useful uh, data source to be then used in a combination with machine learning to process all of these amounts uh, of uh, data and to provide uh, some sort of a proof for the things that are happening in, in in conflict zone, uh, in conflict zone. So the technology can be used for verifying, assessing, and monitoring the consequences of war or the devastation of war, uh, the damage assessment, the population displacement, or even fire uh, uh, detection. Uh, analyzing actually the difference. Machine learnings are much better than humans of recognizing when the fire is coming from a natural forest fire or from a fire caused by uh, explosives or or uh, bombs or bombing. So this is uh, an example of one of the projects that we covered that machine learning enabled processing uh, 5 million data points with, within just 30 minutes, uh, demonstrating the power to analyze uh, bigger and bigger data sets that we are collecting from conflict zones. And this specific example is from Yemeni archive uh, with uh, 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 the organization called VFrame has been working with both Yemeni archive and Syrian archive uh, collecting billions of video frames of footage. And then it is also estimated that it would take an individual almost 3,000 days to search through this information while, while the machine learning systems uh, would require uh, only 30 days. 
Uh, so we are also pointing out to the fact that uh, the um, uh, AI, that not only can AI be enabler for human rights work, uh, but human rights can also create models for better and more rights sensitive AI, which is why we are also having this entire chapter and conversation around human rights based AI systems uh, and placing this in a broader conversation um, around AI ethics. Uh, so we are covering different issues, different challenges in this field for the combining data science and peace building. And we are giving some pointers as well to uh, how practitioners in the field can utilize AI ethics by design in this work uh, and not waiting to create a product, uh, uh, but to actually embed different principles and tools in this work from the design, development, and uh, application phase. And I'm realizing I'm uh, very much over the time, so I'm going to close with ethics, which I think is very uh, uh, telling. I should have started with ethics as well, because it's ethics by design. Uh, but I also know we will have special sessions that are concentrated only on these issues, so we will have more um, uh, times to, um, more time to, to come back to some of these conversations. Uh, and maybe to finish with this one, that the, the entire idea about the not only the book, but our entire work as well, is to create peace builders that are more informed about the potentials of data science. Um, and uh, But also, uh, uh, we want to uh, help data scientists to become more peace builders themselves and to commit to the use of AI in creating lasting peace. So there is space for everybody in this work, uh, and I look forward to having more conversation with all of you about this. Thank you. Just take that chair. Uh, I think we we are uh, roughly on time now, but uh, but if uh, if I we may be allowed to spend a few minutes uh, for a conversation and when we can have a break because there is, as you said, Branka, uh, a number of, uh, of follow up panels and uh, and this was a fabulous setting for these panels because I think you covered sort of a broad set of topics that is precisely what we want to try to achieve with the with the Prio AI days, uh, and I'll open up for a few questions uh, sort of in a, in a in a second, uh, but I wanted to to just um, uh, get back to you on, on, I mean, you started by saying something about the, uh, the overall picture and the investments and, uh, and that there is sort of an, uh, an underutilization, if you like, of, uh, of research on uh, the ways that uh, AI can contribute to peace building. Uh, and so, uh, I, and, and, and this, is, this is very much um, what Prio is, uh, is trying to achieve with, uh, with our uh, initiatives. And you mentioned the Views uh, project. We also have a new project on, uh, on um, uh, uh, trying to uh, discover uh, ceasefires, um, uh, so breaks of ceasefire agreements. And so there is a, obviously a huge potential for technology to, mm. uh, to also uh, help uh, in peace building efforts. But when you talk to the tech uh, companies, when you talk to the general public, when you talk to policymakers, how are they, you know, is, is this something that is resonating with them? Is this something that is driving an interest? And, and do you see any change in, uh, in this field as a result of this, uh, you know, tr push for, for trying to identify the, the ways that AI can be mm. used for peace? Mm. That's a great question. And I think anybody in the room who tried to, to reach out to, to private sector understands this, uh, that peace is a very complicated thing and topic to approach to anybody because people want to stay neutral. They think this is such a political thing to actually get engaged mm. with. And this is why we realized the framing is very important. So uh, how we manage to explain the peace building uh, and that the peace building is something that every single sec uh, sector can contribute to, I think the framing was very helpful uh, and enabled a sort of an entry point. As long as you speak about conflict and security, uh, it's, it's very hard to get any conversation. Uh, they're much more open to work on climate change, development, uh, humanitarian action as well uh, was, I think, much more successful in the previous decade. Um, but there is a lot of space, I think, for a peace building field as well. Said so we have uh, we have time for a few uh, questions, and we have a microphone somewhere in the room as well. Do I see any hands? Yeah. 
Uh, hi, uh, I work with uh, comedy and human rights, and I wanted to ask you Could about... Could you also, yeah. sorry, please introduce, uh, introduce yourself? <coughs> yes, my name is Adrian Minkovic. I'm finishing a master's in human rights at UIO. I'm a writer, and I also work with comedy and human rights. And I wanted to ask you about AI and hate speech that is so difficult sometimes for human beings to uh, make a difference between hate speech and satire. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, What's your opinion? How far is AI? Well, you gave the example about the love word in the <laughs> in the speech, but potentially, how much better or worse will be a computer to make a difference between hate speech and satire or any other way of narrative or irony or mm. satire? So all of these examples prove to be very complicated, but again, something that we can work on, and this is why. I think it's very important to also understand that uh, we need time to simply train systems to recognize something. What we realized, especially connected to your previous question as well, that people want done solutions now and they want immediately. They also don't understand that this is statistics, right? Uh, that you have a probability it will these systems will always have a certain amount of right false positive or false negative. Uh, and this is this part of education that we need to do. And what we realized maybe only in the last couple of years and why we are actually investing so much in capacity building in demystifying what actually AI is when we work with ministries of foreign affairs, with different uh, UN agencies to help people understand who are not experts in, this, in the field what this technology is actually about. And we worked on a project um, uh, related to, to irony. Um, so there are certain ways to just help the, the system understand and train what comes as a more challenging part are, are different contexts, right? Because you cannot train the system to understand every context in the same way. And what we consider as irony in the Balkans, for example, will not be the same how it's considered in other contexts or countries. So those are these nuances um, uh, that are very specific to hate speech uh, and, and that we simply need to figure out and invest more in every single context. We have time for one more question. I also have a final question that I want to ask uh, Branka. So uh, yeah, one more in the back there. Hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Guilherme. I'm from the Embassy of Brazil. And I just want to hear more about, uh, since b being a diplomat, one thing that I can see it has application is uh, on the communication between sides and con conflicts. And I wonder if you if could explore more on this process of engaging actors or trying to perhaps the actor doesn't have the capacity to, to, to translate or to draft documents and how I know it might seem it's simpler than uh, the other uses you 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 mentioned but I think it can be fundamental as well so if you can talk a little about that thank you Thank you. I really appreciate this question, and I love it because uh, I, I think this is crucial. The application that you mentioned as a more simple one proved to be um, uh, game-changing for smaller countries. So with my other hat, I mentioned that I'm also working as an advisor to the German Federal Foreign Office. Uh, we actually developed a tool um, that was helping uh, an AI agent that was uh, helping smaller countries in global digital compact negotiations. Uh, to be able to uh, follow all of the content of negotiations, right? So what we are talking about here, we are talking about thousands and thousands of pages of, on, of documents of a very simple negotiation. So it's far away from any peace negotiation or conflict negotiation out there, or not to mention the climate negotiations, but we tested it on a pilot model and, and we tried to see how this is actually helpful and it proved to be a game changer because so many of smaller countries or medium uh, uh, sized countries were not part of the process at all. So this is this um, potential uh, uh, positive application of a tool that we can see. And this is just one of them in, in summarizing the documents or not only summarizing but helping countries understand if they're more aligned on a certain issue or how their positions are actually uh, deferring or how close they are so they can create a certain alliances to, to negotiate together in the issue. Uh, and Brazil has, it's actually one of the countries that uh, 
is very advanced in understanding the, the potential of AI because one of the first countries that appointed the tech ambassador in the Silicon Valley uh, um, was uh, the approach that some of the countries decided to do to actually send their uh, tech envoys to be there present uh, in San Francisco to be able to establish this communication with the private sector. So I see that there, were, there, there are more hands, but there are also more panels. So I would encourage you to save your questions uh, for the great panels that are coming up. I wanted to take advantage of, uh, of a point that you made, Branka, that we've now been past. Uh, we, we had the Nobel Week uh, last week, and, uh, and there were several prizes in the domain uh, of uh, or re relevant to, uh, to the question of AI. Uh, and of course, Prio is involved in discussing the Peace Prize, which was awarded on Friday. And uh, we've had AI-related uh, topics on our list. We're publishing a list every year of, uh, of good candidates. And the campaign to, uh, to stop killer robots uh, has been on, on our list. Uh, of course, the major challenge remains when it comes to, to the question of, of successes in terms of, of regulating AI. Uh, so, but I hope that this is, uh, you know, whether uh, linked to uh, to um, uh, um, weapon systems or to uh, disinformation. I think this is a huge topic. But if you should pick, uh, you, who would be your favorite <laughs> uh, candidate uh, within the AI domain for the Nobel Peace Prize? In the AI domain. Yes. Oh no, I, I'll <laughs> say, I'll say uh, Prio and Views <laughs> are my. <laughs> My choice for sure, <laughs> but but I do think this this one was mm. was quite a good place. Mm. Uh, I I would personally put it more on UNRWA and mm. the things in Gaza because I just think this is a horrific mm. thing that our societies are allowing to happen. But just putting emphasis on nuclear weapons mm. as well is I think uh, extremely important. Mm. So bringing the this discussion back, especially now seeing how we dropped the ball at mm. the UN and the summit of the future. Uh, not committing completely to to eradicate the nuclear weapons mm. is um, yeah c quite a quite a good sign, but if I have maybe we should open another category just for AI and peace uh, and then definitely it would be prio and use. <laughs> but it is a reminder of uh, of the importance of of emphasizing all the uh, the, the good contributions and certainly I think that that is. Uh, the, uh, the, what we appreciate so much about the work that you're doing is that uh, it's uh, fundamentally important to addressing how we can uh, improve the world uh, also through the use of AI. So thank you very much for setting the stage and uh, uh, I hope that you will all be joining me in a big applause uh, for Branka.